Good to see you. Good to see you back. For those who are new to us, or shul shopping, for just the right synagogue, you found it. No need to go anywhere else. For those returning from uh, summer voyages, welcome back. It's a meaningful day for me. It was on this Shabbat, precisely 12 years ago in the Hebrew calendar, the Shabbat when we read Parshat Ki say that I led my first services here at Stephen White's. I remember that day well, August 27, 2004. There's nothing like the first time. There were 15 people at the services. <laughs> I know, because it was easy to count. And two of them were my wife and my daughter. It's gratifying to see how far we have come and humbling to contemplate the distance we still have to travel. Is there anyone here tonight who was here back then, 12 years ago on this night? One? Yeah, there are not too many. Ah, a couple more. Four. You remember what I spoke about? I'll remind you. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Then and now it was election season. Then as now, we were pumped and primed with polarizing political punditries, pronouncements, positions, plans, perspectives, promises, policies. Some of them true, some partially true, and some completely false. Twelve years later, it seems that there are more untruths than ever. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But we seem deluged with deceit, languishing under ladles of lies. There's so many lies conveyed through all of the new social media technology that was only in its infancy back then. Perhaps that's why we feel that there are more lies now than ever before. There are so many inaccuracies and downright untruths that it is nearly impossible for the average citizen nowadays to discern the truth from falsity. We're in the Hebrew month of Elul, the month of introspection leading up to the High Holy Days. One of the inclinations we try to improve upon is our propensity to lie, to tell untruths. The Bible is filled with examples of all of the untruths told by some of our greatest heroes. As the seer of all knowledge and the oracle of all wisdom, Mark Twain wrote, Everybody lies. Every day. Every hour. Awake. Asleep. In his dreams. In his joy. In his mourning. If he keeps his tongue still. His hands. His feet. His eyes. His attitude will convey deception and purposely. Even in sermons. But that's a platitude. <laughs> There's a verse in this week's Torah portion in the book of Deuteronomy that states the following. Ki tidor neder la elohecha. When you make a vow to God, do not put off fulfilling it. You will incur guilt if you do not fulfill it. Whereas you will incur no guilt if you refrain from vowing. You must fulfill what has crossed your lips and perform what you voluntarily vowed having made the promise with your own mouth. There's something deep 
and moving about this passage. You don't have to say everything on your mind. You don't have to vow. The Hebrew word is neder, as in kol nidre. You do not have to make a promise. You do not have to make a pledge. But if you do promise, you must fulfill it. Because there is something sacred in the word itself. There's something profound in the fact that you spoke. Your words are you, your character, your spirit, your essence. The vows Deuteronomy describes are vows we make to God, but all the more so with respect to human beings. God knows the difference. God knows our innermost thoughts. We do not have to vocalize anything for God to understand us. In fact, Deuteronomy didn't even have to point out the vows that crossed your lips. A vow to God that is unspoken is still a vow to God. Because God knows all. I do not have to utter the words publicly, I will not take the name of God in vain this year to have that vow count. If I think it, God hears it. The fact that it was spoken is what gives it special weight and special significance. If it was spoken, you heard it. We will all speak these vows together in two weeks. We'll pray together and we'll say the words in plural. Everyone else will hear our personal vows. And people are not God. Human beings struggle to separate reality from fiction and truth from falsity. We are made of human stuff and the stuff of human composition is crooked. Such crooked timber can never be made fully straight. The spoken word is the primary way that we approach truth. It is our way of establishing solid and enduring human bonds. And in this way, our words are sacred. Speaking characterizes the human creature. Speaking is the distinctive element of this world. God spoke, and the universe came into being. Bidvar Adonai shamayim na'asu, wrote the psalmist. By the word of God, the heavens were made. The words we utter are the primary way that we establish trust. Morals are corrupted when truth is corroded. That's why we insist on the truth. Truth is virtue. The very seal of God, say the sages, is emet, truth. Lying is a lowly vice. It implies contempt for God. Keep far away from falsehoods, the Torah cautions. If you are not religious, lying is contemptuous. To lie is to violate our conscience, that part of our makeup that is our essence. Honesty is the jewel of our soul. Integrity is the crown of our being. The bond between people, whether in the smallest of units, you and your partner in your own household, or your children, or any other dependents, that bond, whether it is between two persons at home or in a nation, 
is stitched together by the thread of our word. Mutual understanding results through words. To break your word is to betray. And if the bond of truth breaks, we have no hold over each other and no true knowledge of one another. And then our relationships will fray and our social cohesion will dissolve. When leaders in all walks of life and in all institutions, when they lie, they coarsen public values and corrode public trust. Even Machiavelli admitted that the appearance of truth matters. Great consideration is acquired by reputation of sincerity, he wrote. And not to be regarded as a person who believes one thing and says another. We should insist that one of the characteristics and prerequisites of national leadership be truthfulness. Anything less degrades trust. Once on the path of lies, once habituated to untruths. It's hard to reverse course. We become prisoners shackled to the gravity of lies pulling us down. And therefore, it's simply not enough to be satisfied with a cynical statement that all oh, politicians lie. It is what it is. What can we do? We need to insist on the truth. And those social institutions, led by the media, whose purpose is to find the truth and to hold us accountable to untruths, they need to do their job. What a disappointment they've been. And we need to vote for the truth. There should be a political penalty for lying and deception. Now, to be honest, part of the fault is with us. We have this deep-seated desire to want to be deceived. We want our leaders to tell us that everything will be OK. Then we can have it all without paying for anything, even in synagogues. People prefer that rabbis comfort the afflicted rather than afflict the comfortable. So many of us, therefore, are ripe for being conned. Often, we don't want to hear the truth. We can't handle the truth. Truthiness is enough for us. We want to be enveloped by feelings. That's why campaigns are largely about emotions. Reason requires that we think, that we agree or disagree, that we choose. Emotions require no such effort. It's far easier to manipulate us through emotions because we prefer the matrix world of make-believe bliss to the real world of struggle and loss and choice and priorities. Judaism recognized that recognizes that sometimes we must go back on our word. And in extreme and unusual circumstances, it is acceptable to lie. For example, Talmudic rabbis debated whether you must tell the bride what you really think about her. <laughs> One school insisted, if asked, whether she is beautiful, you must tell the truth, even if you think she is not beautiful. The other school said, oh, come on, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> You're going to tell the groom that his bride is unattractive? Really? Tell a white lie. 
for the sake of peace. Generally, to preserve life, if someone's life depended on telling a lie, or for the sake of peace in the household and between nations, there are exceptions to telling the truth. It is not an absolute value. There's nothing absolute in human relations. But it is a very high value. We are not obligated to say everything that is on our minds. That is not truthfulness. That is stupidity. <laughs> and there are many ways of arriving at and expressing the truth. Emily Dickinson wrote a magnificent short poem. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. So we are not obligated to say everything that is on our minds, and there are many different legitimate ways of expressing the truth, including certain circuitry. And there are even rare exceptions that our tradition gives license to state an untruth. But generally, on a personal basis and in social discourse, it is best to follow the advice of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Better not to vow at all than to vow and not fulfill. When you make a vow, fulfill it. Do not let your mouth bring you into disfavor, and do not plead that it was an error, else God may be angered by your talk and destroy your possessions. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>